uh, today on Monday with a very special uh, guest, which I'll allow Peter Marks to introduce. Uh, we're also streaming on several different uh, networks uh, today, so Facebook, Instagram, <laughs> YouTube, and LinkedIn. So um, happy to have you all join us uh, from uh, across those different networks. Uh, without further ado, let me bring on Peter Marks and our special guest. Uh, welcome, gentlemen. Hey, thank you, Christian. And welcome to Morgan Twain Peterson, our guest today. Hello, Morgan. How are you? Great. Very nice to be here. Good to see you, Peter. Good. So for those of you who don't know Morgan, uh, Morgan is the winemaker and owner of Bedrock Wine Company. He's also a master of wine. And he wrote his dissertation on 19th century vineyard practices. And today we thought we'd sort of take a little short look into that, some of the research that he did, and talk about old vine vineyards and field blends that existed since the 19th century in California. But uh, before we get into that, um, I can tell you're not in your winery. It looks like you're probably in a very sacred room with all those great bottles behind you there. <laughs> I, I <laughs> Where am, are you? I am in my dining room at my home. And... Uh, Yes, and around me are the the many treasures of uh, what has been a, a a good life of drinking so far. <laughs> so, and many great stories, I'm sure. Many stories for a story for every one of those bottles, at least. Right. Well, before we get into our topic today, can you just uh, share with us what what you're doing right now, as far as in the vineyards and at the winery? Yeah, I mean, um, you know. The vines don't know that there's a uh, crisis going on right now, so they're they're growing away. So, you know, there's a lot of work going on in vineyards. You know, it's late spring, so we're starting to uh, integrate cover crops, uh, mow, crimp. Um, we're doing our first round of shoot thinning already out in Contra Costa County, which tends to be a little uh, ahead of up here in Sonoma Valley and Napa. Um, and, uh, yeah, you know, things are, we've, we've had a little bit of late rain, which is great because it's been quite a dry winter here. Um, so, you know, things are greening up and, you know, vines are full of vigor and are, are ready to go. So, uh, you know, we kind of have to be too. And the nice thing about vineyard work is it is sort of by definition, socially distanced. Um, so, you know, whether you're on a tractor or if it's our crew working, you know, everybody is giving each other plenty of space. Um, and then in the cellar, um, we've already gone through spring bottling, so things are, you know, pretty low key. So uh, we're uh, interviewing some people for uh, internships for this harvest and um, doing some topping and some other stuff like that. But, you know, uh, it's been uh, it's pretty slow right now, which is a real a real blessing as we just kind of allow um, this whole thing to run its course. Now, you mentioned the, the vineyard work. Are you or your team doing that? work yourselves i know you have a lot of different vineyards that you work with yeah so with bedrock we're pretty evenly split between vineyards that we either own and lease and uh and old vineyards that we have long-term relationships with that we contract fruit for so you know we farm a number of vineyards um all over california so um, the way the work get done, gets done uh, takes a lot of different forms. Here in Sonoma Valley, um, we essentially have our own vineyard management company, which farms Bedrock Vineyard, but then also Campani Portis Vineyard, Alta Vista, Weil, um, and a number of others. Uh, we work with uh, vineyard management companies uh, to farm our vineyard out in Lodi. So basically, we give them the directives of what we want to do, what the cultural practices are, um, what we're doing for fungicides and all of that stuff. Um, and they follow that and then just bill us back. Um, and the same for um, our vineyards in uh, North County as well. So it's a little different, but you know, we've got between our full-time crew in Contra Costa County and our crew here in Sonoma Valley, we have about uh, 15 full-time guys, uh, not guys, it's a very diverse crew, um, 15 full-time human beings going um, right now. Great. Now, getting to our topic today, uh, you passed your master of wine exam in 2017, and the final stage is to write a research paper. Yes. And your paper was on the relevance of 19th century vineyard practices, practices in California and their relevance to today's practices. Can you tell us a little bit about um, about that and what what did you learn the mo that was probably the most interesting having done that paper? Yeah. So first, it's very nice of you not to mention that it took me 12 years to finally do my full master of wine. I wasn't going to go there. <laughs> um, and uh, but yeah, so, um, you know, 
I figured when I did my Masters of Wine research paper that I really wanted it to be something that was apropos to what we do in everyday life here. And um, I felt that, you know, there's been uh, not a lot of research done in terms of um, 19th century planting practices in California. And then also we work predominantly with very old vineyards all over California, and many of them are um, old field blends. Um, and so there's a lot of sort of homegrown theories as to why these vineyards are planted the way that they are. And like, you know, there's certain vineyards that we have that have almost 40 different varieties that are interplanted in them. And so, you know, we've heard theories. I have one vineyard grower that just is like, says he's like, well, no, the people that were budding those vineyards were just all drunk. They didn't know what they were putting out there, um, which is um, a fascinating uh, thesis, but uh, not totally uh, correct, because it turns out that there is actually a lot of thought and order that was being put into the way that these vineyards were being planted in the 1880s and 1890s. Um, and, you know, it's there the way the vineyards are planted were very much a reflection of what California was going through at the time and what much of the rest of the world was going through as it sort of was starting to replant on the worldwide catastrophe, which was phylloxera. I mean, it started in the mid-1870s, and by the early 1880s, it really spread to every part of the world that grew vinifera grapes on its own roots. There's still some outstanding areas like the Barossa and McLaren Vale and areas with sandy soil that still have vines on their own roots. But I mean, you know, in a very short order, the whole world went from essentially all own rooted to about, you know, in the course of about 30 years, like 90% onto American root stocks, which is uh, a huge sea change in the way that vineyards were, um, you know, the vineyards had to be planted to survive, but it also presented some interesting opportunities for um, growers and winemakers of the time to kind of reconsider how they wanted to plant vineyards and what they thought quality was and what parameters they were looking for when they came to defining that quality. Yeah, and, and obviously one of the major upshoots of that was the fact that the Mission Grape, which is a vinifera variety, was planted extensively here in California, and that pretty much disappeared when the replanting took place. And and was that from the immigrants that had brought these other varieties, or how did that whole um, rejuvenation of the uh, vinifera varieties uh, take place? Yeah, so it's really interesting. So I found this uh, amazing quote from a guy named Charles Wetmore, who was one of the um, chief uh, members of what was called the State Board of Viticultural Commissioners, um, which was created in 1880 by the state of California, very fledgling state of California, because you figure at that point the state was 28 years old. Um, and uh, what he said is that in 1880, um, he estimated that 90% of the state of California was planted to mission grape, or we call it the other names for it, just so other people know that we're talking about the same thing. So people can have called it least non prieto. Uh, people have called it Criola Chica. There's actually a whole complex of different varieties that are uh, Criolas. We found like Criola Mediana II and Rosa Peru in these vineyards. And those are all just all sort of lumped under the term mission. But what he said is that in 1880, 90% of the state was planted to missions. And by 1890, he thought 90% of the state was planted to high quality vinifera varieties that were not mission. Um, so, I mean, that is just such an enormous change to have happened inside of a decade, particularly when you think about, you know, the cost, the labor, the toil, everything that went into, um, you know, recreating that amount of vineyard acreage and then having that come up into production. Um, and what was really interesting is that the state of California saw a potential opportunity uh, in the phylloxera crisis and that, you know, Phylloxera was an equal opportunity disaster in that, you know, the stocks of Italy and France and the old, all over the old world, all those vineyards are wiped out as well. And so as a result, the overall um, supply of wine for the entire world just dropped dramatically in the late 1870s and early 1880s. And the state of California actually saw an opportunity there. It's really interesting to see the number of people and the amount of California wines that were showcased abroad 
um, as sort of trying to peddle the potential wares of California wine. There's a real sort of focus on internationalism. And what came with that was also a very concerted effort to try and improve the overall quality of wines in California. And so to that end, the creation of the State uh, Board of Viticultural Commissioners started in 1880, and they were literally charged with multiple things, but the main one was basically, how did you get the wines in California to qualitatively be on par with the best wines from all over the rest of the world? And they worked really closely with uh, vineyardists and nurserymen all over California who went back to the old world, brought back many, 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 like hundreds and hundreds of different varieties that they found, grew them in their individual nurseries, and they actually worked with the state board to actually evaluate these varieties in terms of quality. I mean, it's amazing to go back and look at the work being done, but they were actually evaluating things like Mondeuse or Crab's Black Burgundy, as it was known then, or Rafasco, and they were looking at it for, you know, titratable acidity, um, color saturation, must weights, um, potential ethanol and alcohol. I mean, do very like scientifically advanced work, particularly for the early 1880s. And then they were making recommendations based on what they were seeing um, to vineyardists all over the state of California. And also making it <clears throat> those recommendations based on like the style of wine that people wanted to make. Cause in the 1880s, people were less focused on making the way that, well, we think about wine today and we think Cabernet, we think Merlot, we think Chardonnay, we think very uh, quite often through the lens of variety. <clears throat> well, as in the 1880s, they were thinking about making claret or Burgundy or Hock, if it was a white or, you know, and, you know, H.W. Crabbe, the owner of Tokalon back in the 1880s, was famous because he made a grand claret. But in that grand claret, he listed that there is at least 37 different varieties that went into it. And that was at Tokalon. That is the sacrosanct ground of all Cabernet uh, production in the state of California now. Um, so it, it is really interesting that there was this um, actual quite, you know, focused direction and purpose into the way that, you know, the, the vineyards were planted. So this uh, this idea of planting a number of different varieties in a single vineyard or certain section is not only found in California in the late 1800s, but also in other parts of the world. So what are some of those other regions in the world where even today you see that and, and why is this done? Yeah, so I mean, um, you know, as as part of the research paper, it was important to sort of ground what happened in California contextually into what was going on elsewhere. And very much like um, the rest of the world, I, I, there's been an, a, an additional focus on varietal very much in the last 30, 40, and 50 years everywhere in the world. But traditionally, field blends were found in Chianti, where it's very common to have Caniolo and um, you know, Colorino, and there's all these different, including white varieties that could go in with Sangiovese. Um, the Southern Rhone is an obvious example where Chateauneuf de Pape is, you know, has 13 accepted varieties, 14, 15, 16, if you include all the different mutations of Grenache and other varieties. Um, and then I think, you know, very importantly, you see it in the Duro, um, where the very top wines from the Duro, the most expensive still red wines, and even some of the greatest plots of um, grapes that are used for port, like um, the the Nacional bottling from um, Quinta de Noval, um, those are, you know, 100 to 130 year old vine field blends of upwards of 30 different varieties. Um, and so, and even there, they still talk today about the fact that they feel like they get better color stabilization, better complexity, better aromatics, um, and in general, better balance against, you know, the vicissitudes of, of climate and yearly change by um, using, uh, by having field blends in place. So, and I mean, you see it, it's traditionally was done in Alsace. You see Jean-Michel Dice there who is moving back towards that standard. Uh, there's areas outside of Austria, outside of Venice and Austria, where there's um, the Gemischtersatz wines, which are traditional field blends of 20 to 25 different white varieties. Um, so, you know, there's there's certainly the historical context of where it was being done. And that sort of that very much fed what was, um, you know, what was being done in California. So um, in your definition, the world, oh, uh, the term old vine, is there a certain time period where you consider it an old vine? 
Yeah, I mean, so for me, and then this is also the term that the Historic Vineyard Society, which is a nonprofit um, organization that that I work with, um, we usually just say old mine sort of starts at 50 years. Um, and I think that that's kind of the rough standard um, that I think you see in Burgundy or the Rhone or any place that you go. Um, it is not a legally defined term, though. So that's a very important thing to remember. So, you know, if you go into a place like Napa Valley, where I believe the average vine age is about 11 years old, does that mean that, you know, anything older than 11 is old? You know, so that, you know, that there is some concern over the fact that, you know, there there, there really is no legal definition. Um, but what I not think is also, in, not even in Europe. I mean, even in Europe, when you say VA vine, you know, in a lot of situations, it, it, there's still no actual legal demar legal demarcation of what that means, which is crazy because if the French have not legally demarcated it, that's very surprising. Yeah. And so. what are some of the advantages of an old vine when you're making wine? Yeah, um, I get to ask this question a lot because I think that um, – one, I think with modern viticulture, there's people feel like they can do a lot in terms of, you know, between rootstock and variety and trellising and irrigation and all this stuff to really try to replicate what old vines can do. But the reality is, is that old vines tend to have more developed root systems. Um, they tend to, so as a result, they tend to be less stress uh like, like less prone to stress particularly in uh years where we have more climactic variation for me i really really see the benefit of old vines in years like 2014 or 2017 where we have moments of extreme heat here in california and the old vines weather it like it's no problem and then you look at the interplanted young vines because old, some old vines die and we have to interplant or we just go to our blocks of younger vines and they look completely peaked um and as a result they you know and they immediately sort of have a direct response um you know I don't like to personify vines too much, but I think there is something to be said for the fact that young vines very much are like young people. You know, it's just everything that happens to you is so big. Um, well, as you know, when you're uh, older and you've got more footing underneath you, you sort of can weather storms a little bit better. Um, and I think that that's true. And, you know, from a um, and that all sounds a little woo woo, but at the same time, from just a winery standpoint, you know, there's a lot of vineyards where we have young vine blocks directly next to old vine blocks of the same varieties. <clears throat> and invariably, the old vine blocks tend to get better flavor development, better color development um, at lower potential alcohol and usually do it at lower pH. So better acidity, um, which lends itself towards better stabilization of that color and everything else. Um, and so it's really interesting when you see those two things side by side that it really becomes quite apparent um you know the benefits of what old vines bring and i mean and i think there's a reason why old vines are venerated throughout the world and why things like va vine and burgundy mean something and the same in the rhone um it's certainly not because they produce more or somehow economically are you know uh m more profitable um so there's there's a reason why they're valid or why they're why they're so valued so you yourself, are you more of a young vine where everything's like, wow, or old vine where eh, everything, just take it as it comes? I, I think it's mi I'm middle aged at this point. So uh, we'll, we'll see. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, I continue to become more secure in my rooting as, uh, as I grow older. <laughs> good point. Good. Now, a lot of the old vines are typically head trained. And yes. I'd be interested to hear what exactly that technique is and, and why is that an advantage or is it a disadvantage? Yeah, so, you know, head training is what we call it in California. People call it gobele in the old world or albarello. I mean, there's a bunch of different names for it, but I love Bush gobele. Vine. Bush vine, exactly. I love gobele because it means goblet in French and then you just sort of get to see, you know, as they prune how it kind of is it's like a goblet. And for large clustered Mediterranean varieties, um, I think uh, head training is very, very important because what it does is it's, you know, 
Zinfandel, Carignan, Morved, Grenache, all these varieties tend to have very large clusters. And so what happens is if you put them into a very a more modern vertical shoot position, double cordon situation, one, those clusters kind of sit out the side. They tend to get overexposed on one side. And a lot of times the fruit will kind of all cluster in on itself and get all tied up. And it's not particularly a great thing for airflow. Um, for weight, it can lend itself towards botrytis and um, other fungal issues. Well, as head training basically spreads that fruit out into a three-dimensional sphere and then allows the fruit to hang individually. You get much better airflow. You get better dappled sunshine into the cluster. Um, and so I think it's extraordinarily good for um, a lot of different varieties like that. Um, from, uh, from its working standpoint, the benefits is that, you know, Head train vineyards are typically pretty widely spaced. So in California, we typically see them on an eight by eight planting or a 10 by 10 planting or something like that. So that means eight feet by eight feet or 10 feet by 10 feet. And that means that you're only working with 420 vines per acre in 10 by 10 spacing to 681 vines per acre in eight by eight spacing, which means you have fewer vines to work on per, per acre to put that in comparison, a lot of the modern tightly spaced Cabernet and Pinot Noir plantings that you'll see are closer to 3,000 or 4,000 vines per acre. So in Bordeaux, it's very typical to have 10,000 vines per hectare. So that is basically 4,000 vines per acre, which is very tight. So you have all these tiny little vines, all of which have to have a lot of work that are done on them. Um, the downside of head training, um, particularly as labor has become more expensive all over the world, but um, here in California uh, particularly, is that there's no way to automate it. So everything has to be hand done. Everything has to be hand pruned and head training is a bit of an art. You're not just pruning into a system. You're literally taking each plant individually and pruning towards its individual um, you know, needs, whether it's high vigor or low vigor. Um, you have to do all the shoot thinning, all the fruit work, all that has to be done by hand. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we see a lot of old head train vineyards going away in places like Lodi, where, um, you know, profit margins are slim enough out there that automation has become very, very important. Um, so, you know, there's some real benefits that come with head training, but, um, I, it, there's definitely, you know, some drawbacks as well, um, just from a, just from a labor perspective. Right. Uh, well, closer to home, I'm curious, I'm sure our listeners are too, to find out how many different wines do you make at Bedrock Wine Company? And <laughs> of those, how many are single variety wines versus a mixed variety? Um, it's a good question. Uh, we make a lot of wines. I think this last year, I, uh, <clears throat> 2018 was a very good year. <clears throat> so we um, made a few more than normal, but we made almost 35 wines at Bedrock in 2018. Um, of those, though, um, about 14 are what we call heritage wines, which are old vine field blends. Um, and that's, you know, and I really started the winery in many ways to make these old vine field blended wines. Um, most of them happen to be sort of heavily based around Zinfandel because that tends to be the most widely planted thing um, here in California. But um, you know, we also have ones that are based around Syrah and Grenache and Mataro and some other stuff. Um, you know, of our single varietal wines, we make a little bit of Cabernet. We make um, some Syrah, but even those tend to have a little Viognier co-fermented in them. Um, and even our old vine Zinfandel, which to me is kind of the most important wine we make because it's the wine we make the most of. It's what gets out into distribution. So you see it at restaurants and retail. It tends to be the bedrock wine people see most. I mean, even that, even though I think the 2018 is almost 90 percent Zinfandel, that 10 percent other probably has over 40 different varieties in it because it, that wine is sourced from so many different old mixed vineyards. Um, so, you know, so, you know, even the wines that are technically varietal, for the most part, uh, tend to have some other other goodies lurking lurking in them. Do you have a favorite wine that you make? Is it kind of hard to pick? <laughs> it's very hard to pick. Um, I mean, there's certain every year there's certain wines that I absolutely adore. Um, and, you know, and every year that changes a little bit. I mean, I think that. From just in terms of a total heartstrings, emotional 
um, bases. I mean, I think Bedrock Vineyard and the Bedrock Heritage Wine, which is probably the wine we're the best known for, um, just in terms of accolades and everything else, um, is probably the closest to home because that is, you know, the family's vineyard. It is the wine that I really started the winery to make. It's also has been ground zero for all of our farming and everything that we've learned in terms of how to rehabilitate and um, really help these old vineyards. Um, you know, so all the soil work, all the cover crop work, everything that we've learned, our movement towards organic non-till um, in a lot of situations, all of that is predicated around bedrock vineyards. So that's sort of ground zero and has fed uh, the way that we farm and approach all of our other old vine vineyard sites. Um, so I'd say that that's probably the nearest and dearest to my heart. Um, but it's very hard. There's, uh, there, there's some pretty, pretty incredible vineyards that we get to work with. Well, leading all the bedrock wine company wines aside, if you had no, no money issues and you could plant in a vineyard anywhere in the world, where would that be? And what type of wine would you make? And it can't be California. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's interesting. So my my question, my, the, my answer to this usually fluctuates based on the year. And I also like this because I believe the year I took the Master of Wine exam, one of the questions was, if you could start a winery anywhere in the world, where would it be and why? Which is a great question because you have to get into the economics and all the other stuff of it. Um, I would say just in terms of sheer love, I mean, I adore Portugal. I think that there's some extraordinarily untapped um, potential there. Um, and so, and I also, you know, being raised in a Mediterranean climate, I feel at home there. And so, you know, I think that the old vine field blends you see in the Douro are incredible, but I mean, there's some varieties there like Baga that are grown out in the Barada that I think are just stunning varieties that people just don't know that much about. So I would say that Corsica would be really high up there. I adore Chacarello. Um, unfortunately, I think the Corsicans would kill me, um, but that's just what it is. So. Yeah. <laughs> and I, uh, of course, we have to mention your father, Joel Peterson, obviously famous winemaker, the, considered the, you know, the uh, father of Zinfandel. He has, has a great, there you go, there you go. <laughs> and I'm curious to hear from you, what is the biggest or the most important lesson you've learned from your father? It's really hard to say that there's just one lesson from him. He's been such a profound influence on me and he's also just such a incredibly nice human being. Um, but I think the one thing that I've learned from him, um, which I, you know, I'm now thinking about more cause, uh, I'm going to have my first, my first kid in October. Um, and it's, you know, when I came into the wine industry and when I came back from graduate school and I decided I wanted to make wine, I started knocking on doors and talking to growers and trying to buy fruit. Um, and the one thing that I learned, and this is not something that, you know, your parents ever tell you that they're doing, um, is just the incredible decency and humanity with which my dad always dealt with growers and with people he did business with. Um, there's a lot of doors that were opened to me, I think, because of the fact that, you know, I think they went, well, he's Joel Peterson's kid. He can't be all bad. Um, and, you know, so that I think is a really important thing. And to be honest, there's people in this industry and it's a very small industry. So people learn things very quickly um, that, you know, didn't treat people as well. And when things got tough or the economy got tough, you know, they were very quick to look out for themselves, but not necessarily all those people that support everything that you do when you run a winery. I mean, you know, I think in many ways, winemakers get way too much glory because, you know, what we do is, you know, done on the backs of, you know, years and years and years of work and thought and labor by everybody from people who have planted vineyards to people that have worked in them to all the people that are in the cellar to the people that are out there selling the wines and doing all of that. So um, I think the most important thing is that he's always, you know, taking care of his people. That's that's a great lesson, no matter what industry or business you're in. 
Uh, yeah, for sure. Now, now you're a fairly accomplished winemaker and had made a career yourself. Are there any lessons that your father has learned from you at this point? <laughs> you won't. He won't admit to it. Maybe. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't. You know, maybe what we I, should have him on. We'll ask him. We should definitely question. ask. I think he'd probably have something. Um, he may not want to tell me, but um, no, I. I mean, I think. So what's really fun now is my dad makes his once and future wines um, and he makes them at Bedrock Wine Company. So it's incredible for me and also for our staff and the interns every year because it's like you've got this emeritus professor that's coming in and, you know, making his wines. Um, and I think maybe the thing that dad, I'm not sure so much as learned, but I think one of the things that I take great pride in is like, I remember, you know, decades ago, my dad at one point saying that, you know, at some point as he got later in life and was ready to retire, how nice it would be if he could just have a small winery to walk through, maybe, you know, make some wines, taste wines, talk, teach. Um, and in many ways, you know, Ravenswood became a much, much larger winery than my dad ever intended due to any number of different economic reasons, business partnerships, et cetera. Um, and so, uh, that Bedrock is now sort of like the small family owned winery that I think he always wanted and that he can come in and make his own wines there and get to talk and teach and do all of that. Um, you know, I think that uh, I'm not sure if that's anything I've taught. I'm certainly nothing that I've taught him, but I think that the fact that, um, you know, that's that it's created the opportunity for him to do that um, is, you know, is gratifying. And he is a great teacher, by the way. He and, is. And the acorn doesn't fall far from the tree. So oh, before we uh, turn to Christian, I'll have Christian see if we have any questions. And if you do have any questions, please uh, use the comment section. But I did want to ask you, uh, getting a little bit off the wine subject for a moment, yeah. is there anything that people would be surprised to find out about you that doesn't relate to wine? Anything interesting? Um... Besides having a baby in October. <laughs> right, right. There's that. Um, the, I don't know. I mean, I think most people don't know that I've uh, played classical piano since I was five years old. Um, so just go. on the other side of that wall is my vintage Mason and Hamlin piano. I love old American pianos, um, mm. particularly ones that are not named Steinway, um, because I don't think they get enough credit, which I probably is the reason why I love all these weird varieties and old American vineyards too. Um, and uh, let's see. Have you been getting in some extra playing time the last few weeks? So much. So. <laughs> yeah. I'll have to come hear uh, you sometime. Which Maybe is you put, a, put a little TikTok video out there. Yeah, exactly. A little TikTok of a Chopin Nocturne being played or something. Yeah. Like that. That'd be good. So, <laughs> um, hey, hey. so yeah. Uh, Christian, I just want to check it to you. Oh, go ahead. It doesn't fall too far, but I mean, I also have an incredible love of um, like Western literature. So, mm. you know, things like Wallace Stegner and John Steinbeck and, um, you know, reading about Western water policy and stuff like that. I, all, I always find quite, quite fascinating. But, um, you know, I, I, I don't know. I don't think I'm that, that interested. <laughs> uh, I disagree. Um, Christian, do we have questions for Morgan that yeah, you'd like to share? Yes. So actually, we have one that says, uh, what effect does wine produced from old vines have on aging ability, if it has any effect you, at all? I think you can see the question up there. Everybody can yeah. see that. Um, I think that's a great question. Um, and I think that that ties into what I was saying um, earlier about the fact that when we have older vine vineyards, uh, older vines, particularly in the same site that we have younger vines, we see better color stabilization, typically lower pHs and better acidities, and better uh, flavor development at lower potential alcohols. Um, and all of that is, I think, fundamentally linked to wine ageability. So here in California, where we're, we're blessed with an abundance of sunshine, um, you know, it is very easy to allow things to ripen very quickly. So having great flavor development at lower potential alcohol is really important to maintain freshness in the wine. But the other thing that I need to, like, I always want to remind people of, because it is very vogue in California to pick quite ripe um, in certain situations, is that 
essentially from a chemical standpoint, when you are picking ripe, so let's say 24 bricks is 14.4 to 14.6% potential alcohol naturally. It's quite common in California and other new world and warm areas to pick at 27, 28 or 29 bricks. So 16, 17% potential alcohol, and then ameliorate that must with uh, water or Jesus units as we call it, um, turning water into wine. Um, and you know, and that's and that creates a very different flavor profile. But what that also does is the longer that you hang fruit on the vine, you're literally prematurely oxidizing things like phenolics that are the key sort of the key building blocks by which tannin and other antioxidants are put into the wine and allow the wine to age. So by essentially allowing vin, you know, grapes to hang for a long period of time, you're actually prematurely oxidizing things, um, which actually has a direct effect on ageability. And I think it's the reason why a lot of these very ripe wines that we see from California are kind of immediately delicious, but you know, they're definitely not wines that are Vendigard. They're not going to last a very long time. Um, and so old vines really allow us, if you do it right and you farm them right, to actually pick at lower potential alcohol, put that value on freshness, but then have more of that um, color stabilization um, and lower pH by which the wines can age a little bit better. So it's a very long answer to what is a very simple question. <laughs> so. Great. Good, thanks. I have another question here that I'll, I'll summarize uh, because it is quite a yeah. lengthy, lengthy one. Um, and it is uh, someone who lives in, in Placer County, uh, Krista, and uh, she does some tasting up in Amador County. was wondering if, if what you think of Amador County, what do you think the best grapes are in Amador County? And would you ever consider using fruit from Amador County to make, uh, make your wines? Yeah, I'm not sure the audience can hear. They, the they did hear so, that one. Yes. Oh, they did. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah, I, I heard it. Um, yes. So I I adore Amador County, and we work with Amador County fruit. Um, I think it's a really um, distinct profile um, and a really important one. So we make um, one vineyard designated Zinfandel from a ranch called Asola Vineyard, right in the heart of Shenandoah Valley. Um, and what's fascinating about Amador County is. They're up, you know, because you're in the foothills of the Sierra Nevada there, uh, the subsoils there tend to have a lot of granite in them. So a lot and a lot of unbroken down granite. So you get into Lodi and you get out to Contra Costa County and you're on these sandy soils that are derived from granite. They're just it's been washed off the face of the Sierra Nevada for eons and eons and taken down on the McCollumy and the Tuolumne and the Consumus and all these rivers and spread across the valley um, up in Amador, though, you have these sort of raw granitic soils, and I think it makes for this a really unique structural element. The wines are never the most deeply colored that we make, but they are remarkably perfumed. Um, my friend, I wish I could take credit for this, but um, my friend Tegan, the winemaker at Turley, always says that like Zinfandel in Amador County is almost like the Nebbiolo of Zinfandel, that it's lighter colored, it's t it's got a lot of texture, but it's got a lot of perfume. And I think that's fascinating. Um, and I think there's other varieties that would do really, really well up there. Um, I think Barbera from Amador County can be exceptional because it gets hot enough up there that the vines uh, respire, you know, that basically the vines work through some of the very high natural acidity um, that Barbera has. Um, we work with a little Barbera from Shake Ridge Ranch and Kramer's incredible vineyard up there. And um, we don't bottle it really for uh, public consumption, but the winery team loves it so much. We usually just bottle a little bit for ourselves to drink. Um, and uh, yeah, no, I think there's an enormous potential up there. Um, and I mean, historically, it's been very famous. There's a reason why grapes have been planted in Amador County since the 1850s and 1860s. Um, and you know why there's such venerable old vineyards up there. Awesome, okay. thank you. Uh, we have time, I think, for one more question, um, and which is, more. which which vintage of your heritage uh, wine would you recommend? Uh, whichever Today. one we're selling. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, uh, honestly, for for Bedrock Heritage wine. Um, it's hard. So if you have access to older vintages, which is a little tough, um, you know, I right now I think the 2011 and 2012s are drinking great. 
Um, I think 2016 is maybe the greatest vintage that we've made from it, although 2018 is close behind. Um, if you're looking for wines that I think that those wines really capture the perfume and the freshness and the vivacity of the site. Um, if you're looking for a wine to drink a little on the nearer term, I think the 2015 or 17, which were warmer years. Um, so the wines tend to be a little bit more about fruit forwardness and a little bit more plushness and have more weight. They're really nice in the short term. Um, but, you know, if you have to just go get one, I would say if you can find a bottle of 2016, throw it into a decanter for four or five hours and, um, you know, hopefully it shines for you. I, I have one more question. Uh, looking at that rack of wines behind you, uh, once we get through this pandemic or at least get to some sort of normalcy, and it's time to break out something really good and celebrate um, what wine bottle might make it up there on, on the top shelf. Oh, that's a really good question. Um, you haven't thought that far ahead, I take it. <laughs> no, I mean, no, I mean, I've often thought it's so funny. I've opened in some ways so little wine during this because there's one, my wife is pregnant. Um, and two, there's just like not been a lot of um, people to um, share it with, which is just a very strange thing when you're used to having it be such a part of your social fabric. Um, but I think that there's a couple old bottles that I'm really looking forward to opening. Um, and, you know, and I think probably one of the first will be an old bottle of Madeira because there's nothing that, um, you know, quite places you in, you know, in the context of all world history, like drinking Madeira, particularly when it's like from the 19th century or from the 